Well, I'm going to kind of do a combination of, of, of things. I'm going to share with you uh, some thoughts from this new book, uh, and then there'll be some, some things that I share that are not in the book. But uh, this is a message that I've shared since the first of the year to probably six or seven companies, their management teams. And uh, I think it's been very meaningful. I want to start by just reading five verses out of the book of Proverbs. Um, I think it's probably a good way to introduce what I want to share with you. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For its profit is better than the profit of silver and its gain than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you, compa nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who hold her fast. I think I first heard those words when I was 12 or 13 years old. Um, and I was I've, ever since then. I've been intrigued by this um, this this treasure. <coughs> and over the years, I have um, you know I've sought to gain a, a better understanding of, of what is wisdom. It's, you see it throughout the Bible, um, but you really won't value it until you really understand what it is. And it comes from a Hebrew word. Chakma, which literally means to have a skill or expertise in living. Now you have to ask yourself, what does that really work to? To be an expert in living this life. I mean, think about how that would impact not only your life, but your relationships, um, your work the decisions you make. But what you find in our culture today is that uh, modern people seem to lack uh, real wisdom. For so many people that we encounter in, our, in the work that we do, uh, we also have two individuals that do counseling for us full time. And Jimbo Head over here who works with us uh, uh, runs uh, our prison ministry. Uh, we work with a great group of people. but. Um, the counselors that work for us will tell you that for so many people, for so many men and women, life is not working very well. And many don't know why and really don't know what to do about it. Um, last year, there was a, a really interesting article in the New York Times I want to share with you briefly. Um, and the title of the article was How to Live Wisely. Very, obviously, a very secular article. It was written by Dr. Richard Light, who teaches at the graduate level at Harvard. And this is right out of the, uh, out of the article. <clears throat> he says, imagine you are deemed for a day. What is one actionable change you would implement to enhance the college experience on campus? He says, I've asked students this question for years. And he says, the answers can be eye-opening. He says, just a few years ago, responses began to move away from tweak the history course or change the way labs are structured. He says, we're not hearing this anymore. He says, the students are now asking, how can we live more wisely? And it struck me as I read the article that, that modern life is not working for these young people. And these are some of our best and our brightest. And they want to know why, and they want to know what, what can we do about this? How can I turn this around? And let me share, I'm going to just share with you some, some of my thoughts on this issue of wisdom. I think that uh, one of the main components of wisdom is to have the ability to distinguish between ideas in life that are true and those that are false. One of the best-selling books of all time was Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I don't know whether you're familiar with it. If you're not, you, you really might want to read it. It's, it's, it's very powerful. Um, but in it, he could, could, Covey contends that if people 
are truly going to lead healthy, vibrant lives. He says, your ideas about life must be rooted in what is true. And he gives a great illustration. He says, imagine that you are, you, you have flown into the city of Chicago. It's nighttime. You go to your hotel. You've never been to Chicago before. And you plan to go and, and really see the city the next day. You wake up early the next morning, you go down to the front desk, you ask the person at the front desk, do you have a map for me to use to take out as I explore the city? And the person that's, uh, that's uh, at the front desk says, you're in luck, we got some brand new maps in yesterday. And they tear one off and they hand it to you without realizing that the printer of the maps has made a mistake. And then in fact, what you have is a map of the city of Detroit with the word Chicago across the top. And so you go out and try to make your way around with the wrong map. And Covey says it becomes real apparent that you're going to be really lost with this map. And after about an hour or so, you just, you're, you're, you're visibly shaking and saying, well, what, what's the deal here? And you decide that I've got to try harder. I've got to put more effort into this quest to find the places that I want to see. But as you can imagine, you try harder, you walk faster, and you get more lost. And you get really frustrated. And then you start saying, oh, I got, I got to get a better attitude. My attitude stinks. And so all of a sudden you think, right, I'm going to be more positive. But guess what happens? No matter how positive you are, you're going to remain lost. It doesn't matter what strategy you employ. Tubby says, you are going to stay lost until you find the right map. And he's saying, if you don't have the right map, you're going to find yourself lost in this life. And I find this to be true in the lives of so many people. They're attempting to live their lives with maps that are entirely inaccurate. And it's so easy to develop false ideas about life. And that's why you have to have the right map. I mean, think about just certain issues that, that we all have ideas about, or the world that we live in has ideas about. For instance, what does it really mean to be successful? I mean, what does that really mean? Well, what, what, what is true wealth? I mean, is it just all about money? You know, in the work that I do with men, this is a big issue, is what is true masculinity for men? Because the culture has certain ideas about what it means to be masculine, and the Bible has ideas about what it really means to be masculine, and often they're just completely just miles apart. So what is ultimately true about life? You know, Jesus talks about this. I, I did a study um, looking up a phrase. I like to do this. I like to find interesting words, and then I try to find every verse in the Bible that uses that phrase or uses that word. And one phrase that I found interesting is the word, really it's not a phrase, the word is the word beware. Beware. You know, Jesus uses that word a lot, beware. And you know when he usually uses it, almost every time he uses it, he says beware of false teaching. You know, beware of believing what is false. And so it's so easy to develop false ideas about issues like money or work or identity or happiness because we have false maps. Now, there's a second aspect to wisdom that's important to understand as well. And that has to do with morality. Most people, often I think most Christians, most people in the church think if you make good moral decisions in your life, your life will go well. And in one sense, that's very true. You make bad moral decisions, you know, your life can end up in the ditch. But you know, this is, this is true. And this is particularly true in your work. But it's also true in your life. Do you know that most of the major decisions that you make are not moral decisions? 
there are judgment issues. You have to use good judgment. And this is where wisdom comes into play. Think about your life. Think about, first and foremost, your career choice. I mean, I guess it could be a moral issue if you were thinking about selling drugs for your career. But, but career choice involves good judgment or career change. I think about choosing a spouse, choosing the person that you're going to marry. And then once you do marry, how do you how do you be a good sp- how do you be a good husband? How do you be a good wife? Then you have financial decisions, investment decisions. Then if you have children, raising your child, how do you raise a child? How do you spend your time? How do you establish priorities? So much of this has to do with judgment and you see the need for having wisdom in order to make good decisions. Which we're going, this is kind of what I'm going to really focus on uh, this morning. Wisdom knows how life works. This is crucial. Understanding how life works. And this is one of the things that I've realized about wise people. Wise people are very forward thinking. This is why great business, great business leaders have wisdom because you have to be forward thinking in what you do. And you have to understand that all of life is connected. There's a cause and effect relationship between the choices you make today and what you what you experience tomorrow. Now, I'm going to come back to this in just a minute. <coughs> Ultimately, let me just say this. Ultimately, wisdom understands that there is a pattern or fabric to all of reality. You see, life is governed by certain laws and principles that God has woven into our earthly existence. It's important to realize that, that principles are not good or bad. They are not moral or immoral. They're simply true. And the great thing about principles is that they make life predictable. They create the potential for certain outcomes in your life. But you have to discern what those principles are. In the book, in fact, I in the, in the, uh, the last section of the book is what I, or five of what I consider the most important principles of life. And I'm going to close our time by talking to you about one of them. And the other is, is a principle that I'll have to say, tell you, Harris, I, I shared this probably last time I was here, but it was so important. I think it's maybe the most important. These two go hand in hand. You'll see how they go hand in hand. And they, they in my opinion, are, are two of the most important principles of life because they will ultimately determine the outcome of your life. And that's a pretty bold statement, but as I go through this, I think you'll see that this is true. Now, before I I do proceed, I want to read to you what Covey says about principles. He says, principles always have natural consequences attached to them. There are positive consequences when we live in harmony with the principles. There are negative consequences when we ignore them. But because these principles apply to everyone, whether or not they are aware, this limitation is universal. And the more we know of correct principles, the greater is our ability to live wisely. By centering our lives on timeless, unchanging principles, we create a fundamental paradigm of effective living. Covey goes on to say, you cannot violate these fundamental principles with impunity. Whether we believe in them or not, these unchanging principles have have proven to be valid throughout all of human history. Now, this first principle is called the principle of the path. You may or may not be able to be familiar with it. I'm going to share again, maybe give you some new insights on this today. It's very simple, but it's quite profound. And it really comes out of the Bible. It's not something that's just kind of spelled out, but throughout the Bible, you see the word path used a lot. Um, in Psalm 36, 4, it talks about the fool sets himself on a path that is not good. Uh, Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt make known to me the path of life. And then there's a word that's used in Proverbs a lot. It's the word way. 
And that word way comes from the Hebrew word derek, which means pathway. And there's a verse that I really grilled into the, into the, 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 the minds and hearts of my children. It's Proverbs 16, 25. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death and destruction. It seems right, but it leads to destruction. And, the, and let me just kind of give you a definition of, the, of this principle, or just kind of lay it out. Every one of us is on a pathway that is leading us to a certain destination. Kind of simple. But as I dig into it, you'll see it's very profound. You see, the path that you are traveling down right now will determine the destiny of your life. Whether you realize it or not. See, that's the thing about really everything that I'm going to share with you today. It's not a respecter of persons. In other words, it's true whether you believe it or not. It's true whether you understand it or not. You see, the principle of the path is at work in your life, and it doesn't matter how smart and intelligent you are, how well-educated you are, how attractive you are, how wealthy you are, it doesn't care. It's at work in your life every single day. And I think one of the best ways to visualize this is for you to think in your own mind, and this because sometimes this is hard to do, but try to imagine somebody you know that leads an exceptional life. I mean, think about that. If you know somebody that really leads an exceptional life, in all areas. And ask yourself this question, how did that happen? I mean, you think they were lucky? You think it was just kind of actually stumble upon this great line? You see, what you will always discover is that people are where they are in life as a result of a series of decisions which together form the path leading to their present circumstances. I love to share this illustration. It's, it's a sports illustration, and if you don't like sports, I think the illustration will still be meaningful to you. I had a father share this with me. He, uh, his son went to a sports camp down in Tuscaloosa. Um, it's a football camp. You know, they have football and bat all these colleges have football and basketball camp. Well, this was the summer of 2010. The father said uh, his seven or eight-year-old son was down there in Tuscaloosa, and when he got when he got home, uh, I think it was a five or six day camp. He said, "Dad, you're not gonna believe this. Saturday morning, they had us out on the field at seven o'clock. My group. I think they were divided up in groups of ten or fifteen kids. And he said we were out there and it was early. And he said on the other end of the field was Mark Ingram. Mark Ingram was out by himself with a graduate assistant, and this graduate assistant." was pumping footballs into this machine, believe it or not, and this machine was throwing passes. Mark Egan was out there working on his receiving skills. Now, this is why what makes the story so interesting. <coughs> In the fall of 2009, Mark Egan won the Heisman Trophy. And yet here you have one more season to play, and here he's out on a Saturday morning in the summer working on catching passes. You'd think he'd be back in his room asleep. You see, Mark Ingram didn't win the Heisman Trophy. He wasn't a first round draft choice in the NFL because he was skillful and because he was lucky. He did it because he got on a path that enabled him to develop his skills so that he could become an exceptional football player. And I have to tell you, that's the way life works whether we like it or not. He got on a path where he could develop his skills so that he could become the very best he could be. And that's the thing about it. I find every single person in this room, you have skills. You are, you are unique. You are gifted in certain ways. And the, the question is, are we going to get on a path so that I develop my skills that I can become the very best person, the very, the very best I can be in every area of my life. You see, I, this is what I share often. The principle of the path is at work every day in your life, whether you realize it or not. For instance, every single one of us is on a physical health path of some kind. And if you stay on that path, it will determine in all likelihood the length of your life I realize this is a pretty young group here. You have years to go. But the length and the quality of your life as the years go by. 
Um, if you're married, if you're married, your marriage is on a path right now. I don't think we think in these terms, you know. But your marriage is on a path that's going somewhere. Hopefully it's growing in love and intimacy and depth as time goes by. Or it may be flatlining or it may be going down. If you have children, I've got, as Harris, I've got three that are, uh, they're almost ready to launch. But anyway, uh, if you're raising children right now, the path that you're on, the child ring, is going to impact the people that they become when they hit adulthood. Your career, your business is on a path of, certain, of, of some kind. It's going in a certain direction. You're on a financial path of some kind. And most significantly, you're on a spiritual path. And hopefully you're on a path that's leading to growth, to spiritual maturity, into a deeper relationship with God. But I, I have to, I'll tell you this, because again, from the work I do, I, I see so many Christians, they just drift in. A, a path of just kind of drifting through life. And this leads to, I think, a very significant question that I want to pose. Why do, and I'm just talking about in general. I don't know anything about you, about you guys. But why do people choose paths that don't lead us towards our hope and dreams? In other words, why is there such a discrepancy between what we actually desire in our hearts and what we end up doing with our lives? And why would anybody, why would anybody in this life want to waste their talents and abilities? And yet, unfortunately, it happens. And there's three reasons primarily, and I want to share those with you because I think they're helpful. They'll help, they'll help you, because they really have helped me, I know, get a good grasp of what's going on in my life. And why am I sometimes floundering? Or why am I not where I really know I need to be? There's three reasons. There may be more than three, but I want to share with you three real quick. The first is, um, has to do, and we've had this conversation in our family recently, how easy it is to live with great intentions. Now this is a young, y'all are a young group, y'all got your whole lives in front of you. I, I know you wouldn't even be here if you didn't have great intentions for your life. Not only your work life, but your relational life, every area of your life. You have, we all basically had great intentions. But what you'll find over time is great intention, great intentions are worthless. They really are, they are worthless. Because at the end of the day, it's the direction of the path, not one's intentions that ultimately determine a person's destination. And you know where you see this in a major way? You see this in marriage. The day a person get, the day two people get married, that, that, on that day, they have great intentions for their future. But it's, it's amazing how we get on paths, it's so easy for people to get on paths, that lead them to kind of drift apart. Let me read to you um, from Clayton Christensen. He, uh, he wrote this in the July 2010 Harvard Business Review. Um, I don't know if you know anything about Clayton Christensen. He is a uh, Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he went to Harvard Business School. He teaches there now. And this is what he wrote in this article. He says, over the years, I've watched the fate of my Harvard Business, business School, my, my Harvard Business School classmates from 1979 unfold. I've seen more and more of them come to reunions unhappy, divorced, and alienated from their children. He says, I can guarantee that not a single one of them graduated with the deliberate strategy of getting divorced and raising children who would be estranged from them. In other words, they didn't have the deliberate intention, deliberate strategy. He says, yet yeah, they went down a path that led to this consequence. Sometimes I hasn't to share has to share this this, but it's it's, it's so true and uh, a, a good example. Um, I had a father share this with me. He uh, he had a son 
He has a son. I think the son's 28 or 29 now. We went to uh, a large state university, and uh, he was in a fraternity. And uh, the dad told me a year or two ago, he says, six of my son's fraternity brothers in that four-year period died of either a drug overdose or alcohol asphyxiation. Six in a four-year period. And I share this because I can't, I have a son who's starting his junior year, a daughter who's starting her sophomore year. And I can just remember them, and I'm thinking of these six young men. When they left for school, I mean, you think, they had great intentions for their lives. I mean, going to college, I mean, it's such a great time of your life. You got your whole future in front. They had great intentions, I'm sure, for their lives. And yet, unfortunately, they got on a path that led to their unfortunate premature death. This, this, this is what happens in life. We have great intentions, but it's amazing how we get on paths that lead us nowhere. <coughs> and there's a second reason people don't get on paths that lead them to their intended hopes and dreams. This is very modern. You see, modern people are not on a quest for wisdom and truth. Instead, they're on a quest for fun and pleasure and feeling good and happiness. And what ends up happening in our lives is that we're so often guided by our feelings and not wisdom and good judgment. You see, our desire for pleasurable feelings has a far greater power over our ability to reason and think clearly. A literary figure, Oscar Wilde, who most considered next to Shakespeare to probably be England's greatest author and poet. And uh, unfortunately, he squandered his life, he squandered everything. And these are some words that he penned right before he dies. He's 46 years old. He was reflecting on his life. Listen to what he said. He said, I must say to myself that I ruined myself and that nobody, great or small, can be ruined except by his own hand. Terrible is what the world did to me. What I did to myself was far more terrible still. You see, Oscar Wilde wanted to live a long life and produced great literary work. But it said he also loved pleasure, and he says, I loved it more. He said in the end, he, he put himself, I have allowed pleasure to dominate me. I have, my life has ended in horrible disgrace, and he died broke at the age of 46. You see, folks, a pa a, 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 the path that leads to a life of excellence is often very difficult. You know what is really difficult? Getting started. Getting started. We have a family motto that came from a book written by two teenagers called Do Hard Things. The importance of pushing yourself and doing hard things. And I tell my kids that the path that leads to a life of excellence is generally going to be difficult, particularly getting started. I said tell them, but if you persist going down these difficult paths, you know what happens over time? They get easier. Not because the nature of the task has changed, but your ability to do it increases. I uh, use this example, I think it's a good example, um, in my own life. My, uh, my wife is very physically fit. And for some reason, about four years ago, she decided she was going to start swimming in addition to everything else she did. And I told her she lost her mind. The problem, and, and one of the problems I told her, I said, you didn't really grow up swimming. You never swam competitively. You didn't really know how to swim that well. She didn't listen. She goes out, she had somebody kind of help her get going and kind of giving her some instructions, showing this is what you should do. These are the workouts you should do. And the first, uh, uh, the, the first night when I got home, she shared with me, so how'd it go? Horrible. It was a horrible experience. She said, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I drank a couple of gallons of pool water. I said, sit down, just give it up. 
but not my wife. She stuck with it. She still swims today. Recently, she had an older man at the, at the pool where she swims ask her where she swam collegiately. He really thought that she was a collegiate swimmer. And she really is a good swimmer today. And something she started out doing really <coughs> hating, she'll tell you today, she really enjoys it now. You see, nothing about swimming has changed. But her ability to do it has increased dramatically. John Piper put it best, all training is painful and frustrating as you develop certain skills. However, over time, as these skills become second nature, they lead to greater joy in your life. And so I would ask you, as we sit here this morning, to take a good look at your life and how you spend your time and answer this question. Am I a wisdom and truth and even growth quest in my life? Or am I more on a fun and pleasure and feel good happiness quest? Because you know what? These two pursuits will always lead in opposite directions. Now, I'm going to just, I, I'm going to throw this in just because I, I think it's important. I, I, I've shared this message ad nauseum with my kids. They've heard it, and they've heard it, and they've read my books. And I, I can remember after about the second or third time, my daughter, who's very outspoken, right in the middle of it, she said, oh, <clears throat> Dad just doesn't want us to have any fun. And I said, you know, it's easy to think that. I think a lot of times people think Christians don't have any fun. But you know, one of the things that I've come to realize is that there's a place for pleasure in life. In fact, God gave us it as a gift. I often tell people, you know, God didn't have to give us taste buds. And all food could just taste the same. But he did. And what I've come to realize is that, that, that pleasure is a gift from God that He's given us to bring delight into our lives. And this is the problem we have with it. It just doesn't satisfy us. And it never was meant to be. And if it becomes the object of your life, it will ruin you. So I had to throw that in. Now third and final reason, this will take but a second, is that we don't get on paths that lead us to our intended hopes and dreams is that we're always looking for shortcuts. You see, to really grow and develop any area of your life requires you to go down some difficult paths. And instead of going down the difficult path, you know what I'd rather do? I'd like to find a shortcut so that I don't have to do this. And the way we do this as modern people is we look for easy techniques and formulas. All you have to do is go to a local Barnes & Noble or Books A Million, go to the self-help section, and you'll see them. They're all over the place. Seven easy steps to have the perfect marriage. Five simple techniques that will enable you to double your sales. On CNBC, you hear this all the time. Quote, easy stock trading techniques that will make you millions. And notice, the steps are always what? Easy. They're always easy. You see, in today's world, if you have a problem, there's somebody out there who's going to promise you a formula to enable you to easily overcome it. And this, I want to hear, don't you hear it? This becomes a lot of people's approach to life, particularly business. Is there any shortcut we can take? Is there some simple formula that will enable us to do what otherwise is hard and difficult? I'll just share this with you. In reality, there's a, there is an art to living this life. And it's not a, a quick and easy formula. In fact, in order to make, the, to make progress on the important, meaningful objectives of life, it requires you to get on the right path and steadily plod down it and stay on it. And if you do, your life will flourish. So that's the first principle and the three reasons that we don't get on the right path. Now this second principle 
Uh, it's in the book. And um, it's kind of linked to the principle of the path, as you'll see, but uh, it's different. Um, the principle of the path has to do with a kind of a getting on a pathway, a kind of a, a trend of life. This has more to do with the decisions we make. And we make a lot of decisions every day. My wife, I went to uh, went through a, a year-long course a few years back that really touched her life, really had an impact on her life. And it was a prayer and counseling ministry that helped people deal with and heal from the painful struggles of their life. And I share this because the foundation of all their teaching and their, all their understanding on people's problems was built on this principle, was built on this law. And I ask you to think about just the issues in your life, any struggles you have. See if this applies in any way. Now, I'm going to start by introducing this with a really, really great story. I'm going to read it to you. It'll take a couple of minutes. It's a great introduction to, to the, uh, the principle that won't take very, be very long to, to share with you. <clears throat> At 18 years of age, Jane Lucretia Destere was a talented and beautiful young woman entering the prime of her life. As she stood on the bank of a glistening, dark lake in Scotland, she pondered plunging into the depths, taking her life. She had lost all hope. The year was 1815, and her husband John had just been killed in a duel. He left her penniless, alone in a new country with two babies to care for. Her family lived in France, so she was without support of any kind, emotional, spiritual, or financial. As she gazed into the rippling waters of the lake and reflected on the pain and brokenness of her life, she looked up and spotted a young man on the other side of the lake plowing furrows on the hillside. He was completely focused on his work, not aware of her eyes upon him as he guided the plow behind the horse with a single-minded purpose. In her moment of despair, she was so impressed with the young plowman's focus and concentration to do his work well that, her, that his well-timed example pulled her out of her own nightmare. <clears throat> but suddenly she was infused with hope receiving a timely dose of wisdom. She knew what she was supposed to do, move straight ahead as a young plowman, as she too had a meaningful task to fulfill. Her children needed her. They lost one parent already and did not need to experience this, the, the agonizing loss of another. When she processed the young man's focus and commitment, she was given wisdom. Or to put it another way, she was given a wise heart. When her heart became wise, it then became brave to do the right thing, which was the hardest thing to do. I think that's important. When, she, when her heart became wise, it then became brave. A few weeks after this experience of the lake, Jane came to faith in Christ. Several years later, she married Captain John Grattan Guinness, the youngest son of the famous brewer Arthur Guinness. The prominent author, Oz Guinness, who was one of my favorite authors, is the great-great-grandson of Destair. And he made this observation. He says, if it had not been for the plowman, the tragedy of the dueling husband would have been followed by the tragedy of the duelist widow. And my, my great-great-grandmother was unusual for several reasons, including the fact that she conscientiously prayed for her descendants down through a dozen generations. Ours is a heritage of faith, which I, for one, am extremely grateful. But when Destera had seen, had been a teenager, gazing into the deep, dark abyss of the lake, imagining her death, she could not see, listen to this, five generations ahead of her, or any of her descendants. All she could feel was that life, her life was finished. But it wasn't finished. By looking at a purposeful young man plowing on a hill, she realized there was hope. She could take the path of the lake or she could take the path of moving ahead in spite of her mind-numbing emotional pain. Destair had no idea what the future held, nor could she imagine she would ever have another husband who would deeply love her and her children. All she knew at that moment was that she could choose death or life. She had a choice to make that could impact not only her, her children, but even the lives of all of her descendants. Listen to this. This is our wrap the story up. Rarely do we fully realize the significance of the decisions and choices we make. But we need to know this. 
they always, they always bring consequences into our lives. And two things strike me about that story. The first is the magnitude of so many of the decisions that we make. I mean, we make decisions, somehow we don't think about it, but they have huge potential implications. But the second is to think about, in this story, think about the influence or the influences that impact the decisions we make. She was influenced by this young man who had no idea. Now this principle is one that you primary, you are probably familiar with. It comes right out of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And it's, it's huge. It's Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man or woman sows, this he shall also reap. You know what? There are four places in the Bible where you read that phrase, do not be deceived. Like I've done a study, taking those four verses and looking at each one of them. But it's as if God is saying, you have to watch out. You have to pay close attention. If you're not careful, you will be deceived. And I think that's what happens with the lives of so many people in our culture today. Particularly young people believe that they can beat the system. That they can make bad decisions and they can get away with it. But God is saying, don't be deceived. And then he says something else. He says, I will not be mocked. Now, what's so significant about this principle, this law, if you want to call it that, Paul uses the illustration of the world of agriculture. And this is very simple. If you plant pumpkin seeds, what are you going to get? Pumpkins. If you plant watermelon seeds, you're going to get watermelons. This is the way it works. But you know what? So many people don't get this. They think they can sow watermelon seeds and get pumpkins. But that, you clearly can't do that. You can't sow foolishly and get an exceptional life. You just can't. If you sow nothing, you're going to get nothing. Bad decisions lead to bad consequences. I promise you, so many of us don't get this. And it strikes me that in one sense, and I'm not sure people get this, you know, God is not saying, you follow my ways or I'm going to smack you. You know what he's saying? If you don't follow my ways, you're going to smack yourself. Or Solomon says in Proverbs 8, 36, he speaks of how we so easily injure ourselves. I've had this conversation with Jay Lloyd and Steve Singletary in our office. One who does just general counseling, he's one of the best, I think, in the city, and another is uh, a guy that does just pure marital counseling. And both of them, both of them, say that so much, let me put it this way, they put it this way, most, not all, most of the pain and suffering in this life is self-inflicted. It's living outside of the will of God. Another way of looking at this is this. God's words and God's will is not a bunch of restrictions. It's not a bunch of rules that you follow. You know what God's word is? What God's will is? It's an owner's manual for our lives. You know, when you follow an owner's manual, you thrive. When you cast it aside and you don't, your life will break down. That's true of any kind of machine, but it's true of our lives as well. I'm about out of time, so I want to, I want to leave you with this thought, and then I'll maybe give you a couple minutes if any of you have any questions. But, you know, people... 
people who make, or let me put it this way, people who possess wisdom make good choices. They really do. And they make good decisions. And outline of the book, I think, is a path that leads to wisdom. But I end with this thought, and I'm going to leave you with it. Um, when you read Proverbs, and when I was reading in Proverbs 3, you might not know if you noticed it, but Proverbs is often, often personified. She is more valuable than wisdom and gold. Nothing you desire compared with her. It's personified. And, in fact, I'm truly convinced that the wisdom of God is someone that you can know. And if you live in close relationship with that person, you'll become wise. And you will. You see, this is the New Testament majesty. And of course, that person is Jesus. Colossians 2, 3 says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he, offer, he, he makes an offer to us. He offers to walk with us through life. He offers to walk with us through our work life, through our family life, through every area of our life. That's what, in the book, I try to take all the areas of life. It's amazing the wisdom that God gives us. And basically, he invites us to walk through life with him, allowing him to lead and guide us. And I was thinking on the way out here, a great verse. Let's see if I got it right. It's Isaiah 48, 17. If you don't know this verse, you need to. It says, Behold, I am the Lord your God, who leads you in the way you should go, and teaches you what is best for you. That's what he wants to do, to teach us what is best for us.